operations. That's correct. Um, are you with them on those? I'm not here operationally to actually go in and lead them on an assault. My job here is solely to train them, OK? I had retired from the Defence Forces in 2005. I was uh, asked, could I come and give a hand here uh, just to work on the Special Forces? You have a lot of international experience, don't you? Well, with the Defence Forces, yeah, we travelled all over the world. Obviously, we operated in, in Lebanon and East Timor and other places. Uh, but a big part of my uh, operational time in the Ranger Wing was to do with uh, in the, the black rolls, we say it, so that would be counter-terrorism. OK, so that's really what this is. A ship is just like a big building, OK, that's floating. OK, so they're all the same things apply. Very soon after Griffin arrived, the fledgling commando unit was called on to deal with a hostage situation. Griffin was asked to accompany them, something he definitely hadn't signed up for. Up until this, the Coast Guard were really used for a lifeboat service, OK, and for fishery protection. That they hadn't used their weapons. So on the way out, they welded on a Russian anti-aircraft gun, and they were welding it on as we left the harbour. So, you know, I suppose it's on-the-job training. Yeah, but some people's on-the-job training involves being shown how to use a new computer. <laughs> not, get, not getting RPGs fired at you and, and, and Kalashnikovs. Yeah. When it comes down to it, okay, when it comes right down to it, you know, you go into those situations for the guys beside you, okay? Sure, you're doing it for your country, okay? And that was my experience, certainly, with the Army Ranger Wing. I understand what, where these guys are. They're young. They're trying to defend their country. All I did was just try and do the best I could to get them into the right type of training, OK, and to the right, you know, condition to go and face that fire. Yeah, but these yeah. things unfold. Absolutely. You have experience. You're yes. the most experienced man on that boat. Absolutely. You're not going to stand back and say, and you're, you're, you're cocked at the AK and you that's him <laughs> over there. He'd be a good fellow to fire at. Yeah. You're going to be in the thick of that. Uh, well, it didn't happen. No, 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 We're just getting into pirate season, OK, and as I said earlier, with two Seychelles gone already, and there will be other incidents, OK, during this season. OK, so the guys just have to be ready for it and try and be one step ahead of the pirates. In the ongoing battle for security in the Indian Ocean, many countries and interested parties are operating on the ground. Organizations like Interpol, the FBI, and the US Naval Criminal Investigative Service also provide vital intelligence to the Seychelles. The Seychelles is a perfect environment for us because of the aggressive nature of uh, Seychelles law enforcement in dealing with, with the problems of piracy and narcotics. To work with uh, NDEA and develop information that might lead to maritime interdiction of drugs, that's what we get paid for. To work with FIU and, and Declan Barber and potentially get at the supporters of piracy, that's, that's what I get paid for. I suppose when you think about this, it's extraordinary. If the Somali pirate ships here, you've got the, the pea boats, the gunboats, that have been a gift from the United Arab Emirates, just there. Over there, just to the left of those trees, there's an American warship. You've got the Irish guys who are assisting the, the Seychelles people. And there's a huge amount of people who have a vested interest in this place. Uh, strategically, it's incredibly important. You've also got the French here, Russians and the EU. And everybody wants a little piece of this. And because this place has no money, they have to take assistance from wherever they can get it and also keep their independence, which is an incredible tightrope that they have to walk. It's, I, I don't envy them. I really don't envy them. The Seychelles' zero-tolerance approach to piracy and the non-payment of ransoms has seen them engage in forceful military tactics, which has led to the successful prevention of five separate pirate attacks. The result? The effective release of 35 hostages and the incarceration of 63 Somali pirates held here in the country's only prison. If no ransoms are paid, the business model is dead. But also, ransoms are paid to protect life. Of course. So um, where, where, how do you find the balance? The, it is a very difficult balance, but, the, uh, but I will look at it from a slightly different angle. In any capital of the world, or in any city of the world, if a bus is taken hostage, I doubt that ransoms will be paid. Now, the fact that it's taking place at sea should not mean that we suddenly agree that this is a lawless area and that we have different rules. When pirates seize hostages, they are committing an act which is essentially terrorism. My time in the Seychelles was drawing to an end, but there were still two hostages being held by pirates somewhere off the coast. Despite that, Niall Scully and his unit 
were going on a night drug raid to the outer islands, and I persuaded them to take me with them. Sure. Right, guys, um, that last week we had an NDA team attempting to make an arrest on Pralin, and uh, they were unable to effect that arrest as they were surrounded by a group of criminals. Uh, at that time, they were outnumbered approximately five to one. The mission Team Alpha, Ziggy's team, would advance the residents and a primary reason for being there is it is a drug search. I had a report this evening that suspected pirates have been sighted approximately 20 nautical miles from our destination. Three skiffs observed in the area. I've instructed Ken when we board the boat to liaise with the team leaders and we want lookouts posted on the way over and on the way back. And if you spot something, guys, don't take your eye off it. If there's any engagement to be done, that would be done by the rear gunner on the boat. We're about to head down to the harbour now. Uh, and we've just received the information, not only are we going on a potentially dangerous raid, but this pirate's about 20 miles from where we're going. And there's two ways of viewing it. If you are going to get met by pirates, it's the right team to be with. But at the same time, it's a double threat. Hmm. As I boarded the gunboat, I was struck by the sheer scale and treacherous nature of the job that this small group of men face in trying to protect these most hostile of waters. As we got closer to the shores of Pralin Island and the risk of a pirate attack got smaller, I began to relax. All we had to worry about now was the next stage of the operation. To find, confront and arrest a drug dealer and his gang. There could be up to eight. Uh, and it's a very small house. But it just depends. Uh, we could be looking. In fact, the less people in here folks, the better. It'd be easier to control. Is this it? Basically, what you would normally see in that blue paper was heroin. It's heroin wrapped in that blue paper. The hardline approach the Irish are taking to the Seychelles problems may be working on the ground. But questions have been raised as to whether it can be effective in the long term. Waves of of foreign nationals have come in and gone. And the question is, why? We talk about the strong arm of the law, but the strong arm of the law needs to be seen to be working. If it's tied up behind somebody's back, and that's the general perception that very often that's what's happening, and you can bring in as many foreigners and, and many foreign nationals to try and resolve the situation, it's not going to go away, because there isn't, there isn't the ultimate will to make it happen. You hear stories all the time about who's bringing the drugs in. I mean, the small guys, if they can't bring in two million uh, rupees worth of drugs into the country, we know who's got the money. We know who, who can bring the, the drugs in. And, and are those people, are they in power here? No, they're well connected. Okay. They're well connected. And they're obviously now very wealthy people. Do you think there's the political will here to catch the boys at the top? A lot of people think they're very well connected. What I would have to say, it has been our experience that there's an awful lot of misperception out there. For example, that there are very big drug lords, that some of them may be politically connected. Liam, we haven't experienced that directly. Now, having said that, perhaps someday we will actually come against uh, a figure within the establishment or who's prominent in some other sense, who is either organising or involved in drug trafficking or money laundering or, or whatever. And, and, and we believe, and I don't think we would stay here if we didn't, we absolutely believe that, that 